hello and welcome to my talk about exploring Jenk to its fullest extent, how I learned to have fun. My name is Osan Asnas, uh, also known online as Lost Geek. I am the leader of the Standard Balance team. I've been a member of NWE for a few years now. And generally, I've played this game since 2017, around when Terminal Directive came out, and have been always interested in deck building as well as playing the game. So I've always tried to kind of get better at both. And over the years, I've built a lot of decks. I've uh, in the later years, built a lot of good decks together with my team members and generally have seen that um, what people colloquially call as jank is not that different from a really, really good deck that is poised well to do well in tournaments. And also, uh, typically when that happens, when what was seen as jank before becomes good, um, those games tend to not be very fun in the in the colloquial sense because the deck is doing something that is really strong, something that was seen in a niche because it was weak before, and when it becomes playable, it tends to be overwhelmingly good at what it does. So with that, I want to start with a short introduction to what Jank is. Um, I've written a forum post in the Cinemac forums about this in July 2019, and you can see it on the right, it is rather long. Uh, I've written a lot of things, I think today I would try to keep it much more shorter, and some of the ideas I maybe now see a bit more nuanced, but uh, the, the, the general ideas in there I still think hold true today. And um, yeah, I, I want with that article I want to find out... Um, what this thing people call Jank actually is. And I, I found that it was really good to think about it uh, by defining a central goal, which is winning the game. Might sound pretty obvious, but there are a number of players that play the game not necessarily because they want to win the game, but because they want to assemble a certain kind of rig or because they want to explore a certain kind of storyline by the cards that they include. And while this is a totally well way of playing the game and people also have brought this kinds of decks to tournaments, um, it is difficult to reason about um, players or decks that are trying to do something that is not on the corp side scoring 7 points or killing the runner, on the runner side stealing 7 points or milling the corp. Because then we come into, the, uh, into territories where we need to define what we're actually trying to do. And I feel it is more easy if, or like <laughs> this is the only way of approaching things competitively. Uh, if we look at decks that actually try to win the game. But now, if we do that, it becomes really, really difficult to think about decks that might achieve this goal the best way, because there is a whole range of possible decks, and choosing the one deck that is capable of winning the game in the best way is really, really hard. So what people often just intuitively do is define a sub-goal that is easier to achieve, which is win the game doing X whatever this X might be. This central premise X could be a card, could be a bot state, could be anything. So for example, if it is a card, it could be like right now, the card Endurance. How can I get the boat to look as good as possible? How do how do I build a deck that uses the strengths of the boat in the best possible way? If it's a bot state, it might be like an asset spam bot state. If I'm playing any age and I'm assembling 20 assets on my board, I want those things to do a thing. Back in the day, maybe with RP, I wanted to have political dealings that installed in my agenda so that I then could advance and score out. Uh, it could be some sort of prison board state. It could be anything. But it is much easier to think about building a deck that does a thing rather than building the best deck. So whenever we build a deck, it is important and really good to do this, um, to actually think about this central premise and say it out loud or like write it down or reason about it very clearly because typically um, this is something we do intuitively and in the end it can get muddied up and the clearer it becomes the better the deck ten tends to become. Another example for what the central premise might be is the central premise might be make money and draw cards as a runner. This is what we typically then end up calling a rec deck because um, a lot of the problems that the corp can, especially the corp as this is asymmetric, but to a certain extent this is also true for the corp side. But as a runner, a lot of the problems that the corp can um, put forward can be solved simply by having enough money 
You can trash cards by having enough money. You can get accesses by having enough money. You can even just win by single accesses if you have enough of the money <laughs> that you need to do that. Um, you can include cards that do this better for you. For example, if in, in the case of trashing cards, you might be freedom. You might play imp. You might play embezzle. Something like that. Emb embezzle as an uh, as an example of a card that actually trashes things that you couldn't otherwise trash just by having money. Um, but all of these cards come with certain downsides. As they become more specific, they might become more efficient at doing the thing that they do, but they don't do the other things for you. And money, just having credits, is a good way of ensuring that you can do all the things that the deck does need to do. And over the years, certain archetypes like Rec Trim or Rec Anarch were really, really good at just using money as their resource to interact with the, with everything the cop could, could put forward. And if we now look at the question that I posed in the beginning, what is jank? Um, typically, a jank deck tends to be one that forgot about its central premise or like had a central premise in the beginning and then added a few more cards in that not necessarily synergized with the ideas that they did in the beginning and then the deck tends to be muddy the cards don't synergize well with each other and if a player comes to a quote-unquote good player and ask them what can i do with my deck they tend to say just clean it up remove these 10 cards add and draw an econ and it'll become better and while that is true that might not be what the player set out to do like those cards were in there for a reason they found them interesting for a reason. They were doing something for them. And it is real difficult to um, give advice to someone coming to you with these kinds of questions if you uh, don't establish first what they were aiming to do. What was this deck trying to do? And once we defined that, we can then try to optimize towards that goal. That goal might not be what quote-unquote good players would aim for when building a deck, but sometimes the, the good way of looking at the game is not necessarily the best way of looking at the game because there might be preconceptions that the top players have at a certain moment in time that are just not true. And for example, as I will show in the next slide, um, there are a lot of cards that were seen as unplayable at one point until they weren't. For example, when CI and Wizard came out, people thought that these IDs just weren't strong enough. CI had to face crims with a count siphon, or like non-crims with a count siphon. And therefore, the credit pool was getting so low that you couldn't even hold the cards in hand that you need. Until cops were able to just plow forward, have 20, 30 credits, have a lot of cards in hand, and then just combo out with them. Wizard is another example. Like, three credits is a lot, but... What if the Corp deck doesn't have any trashable cards? Then Wizard looks really, really bad. And people thought this was bad. Until they realized that they could build an Arc deck that can win against the decks that don't have any trashable cards. And then have Wizard ju just help them with all the trashable stuff. With all the asset spam. With all the other kinds of um, archetypes. And therefore they, they realized that I don't need to do everything with my ID. I can just do the relevant things. Um, and the same for all the other cards in here. They were, they have seen competitive play at some point in time. And just to emphasize one of them, Hype Mind Max that we built in NWE was a deck based around the premise that was tried and tried before because Hype Mind was around for a long time and never really looked promising. It was a deck that did interesting things, but Never to a point where people were saying, oh, this is really strong. Until we looked at it again when Cookbook and Botulus and stuff came out and realized, hey, now is the time that this card does really, really do a very good thing in the game. It was always doing this thing in the game, but that thing wasn't necessarily the strongest thing you could do. And right at that point, we were of the opinion that now is the time. Now this card is good. So everything is rel relative. It depends on the meta that you're in. It depends on the card pool that you're in, the synergies that you can build up. So it is really, really difficult to um, just go at the game and go for the best things because you never know what the best things are. So I find it really more helpful to just keep on building decks under certain premises, become better at deck building while doing so, and also sometimes stumble upon things that you previously thought were bad and 
then you realize they really, really aren't. So what I, I want to now give some examples of decks that I built in the past or that people have built in the past that did this kind of pro progression. And the first example that come, came to my mind was the counter surveillance decks. Counter surveillance is a card that um, uh, rewards you for going tag me, for having a lot of tags, and then gives you a lot of excesses once you play it. Uh, decks at the time when I built this deck on the right were playing counter surveillance out of Anarch, but I was a Shaper player and I found it fun to import into Haley, so I made it my central premise what is the best counter surveillance deck that I can build out of Shaper? To be honest, I don't think the deck list on the right is that deck. I think the deck list on the right does a good job at being a counter surveillance deck, but looking at it today, I might have changed a few slots, done a few things differently. I think, for example, uh, three counter currents are way too much. There are probably other events like, um, I don't know what was legal at the time, probably um, um, employee strike, stuff like that, that would have also been good. But in any case, at that point in time, 2018, I was playing the game for a year and I thought this did a good job at what I wanted to do. So this, is, this was not necessarily the best counter surveillance deck you could build, but it was one that I could build. It was one that took the premise of building it out of Shaper and look what it could do. We had cards like Laguna, which were drawing a lot of, lot of cards. Uh, we had cards like Paparazzi, which protected you. And then I realized, hey, Dummy Box is a card that helps me protect all my stuff. So it kind of went into the same direction as the um, Data Leak Reversal decks back in the days were going. So I found these ideas of the past, Wildest Net Pavilion and some form of tag me but resource heavy deck and tried to build the best thing I could build around that. And I had reasonable success with the deck. I didn't do really well at tournaments but I was still learning and it was fine. And then I put it away again. A few years later, um, this happened. We can see a different deck with a lot of the same cards. Dummy Box, Counter Surveillance, Paparazzi, uh, Wireless Net Pavilion, like the same ideas, suddenly became first at US Nationals with, when Whiteblade brought this deck and did really, really well with it. And um, I find it really interesting how um, at that time Liza did not exist. Nobody was looking at counter surveillance in Criminal, but the same ideas that I just randomly found by asking myself what is the best Shaper deck I can build with this, which was not the most obvious thing to do, actually became fruitful here. Not for me though. I actually tried to build this deck back in the day as well. Like you can see, it won nationals in November 2019. I built it in September when Liza uh, just came out. This deck on the left was not it. I played this, I did okay with it. It felt fine, it felt funny. I found like, haha, I, I found an interesting thing to do. I did it, that's it. Unfortunately, I wasn't good enough at deck building at that point to realize what I stumbled upon. Uh, and fully use it to its fullest extent. So take this as an example of if you go at it for long enough and if you like think about it critically enough, you can find the decklist on the left and not go like, ah, this doesn't win games, but rather go, oh, the counter surveillance interaction with Liza is really strong. So maybe I can build more on that. What else can I do? For example, what breakers can I use? I used normal breaker seed because I didn't think about it too much. Whiteblade just used some fams to get rid of the ice that was problematic and just use Omakua and yeah, just use Omakua for the rest. Uh, Diversion of Funds is a strong card that I also knew was a strong card, but I thought it didn't really fit into this deck, but it obviously did. It was a, it pressured the cop so much that it enabled you to do the things that you otherwise couldn't probably. So um, yeah. Taking the central premise and going as far as it with it as you can is a really good way of landing at these decks that are like kind of underdogs that go under the radar of a lot of players and take the Netrunner world by surprise once they really win something big because um, it happened to be a good thing to do at the time but nobody thought about it before. Another deck, more recent, uh, that I want to talk about is Chabata CDM that uh, Yakuza built and at that point, I was also part of NWE, and I was like, I at least um, spectated the deck building process and the, the ways he built it. Because um, Elvin is a person, shout outs to him, um, who really, really likes to play these horizontal decks. Who, 
at least 20 assets and a lot of cards on the table that do something. And this was... In the beginning, I thought this was just one of those decks that just happened to work for him because it works with his playstyle, with the things that he likes to do in the game. But then after thinking about it more with him, we realized that, no, there was actually something just fundamentally good about this deck. And the, the reasoning goes something like this. You start at the point that Sandbox is an amazing agenda. At that point, we re already like all realized that because the PD decks were using it, a lot of decks were using it. So Sandbox is a good agenda. Let's see what we can do with it. The first thing that came to mind was, okay, Macrophage is good ice. And CTM is a deck that really wants to play cheap ice that does a lot for you. And once you score a sandbox, Macrophage becomes a monster. Because it has four, four subroutines, which makes it hard to deal with for a lot of uh, runner breakers. It has seven strength, which also is like huge. And it costs three. So the numbers on it were good. And it even said end run on it, even though with a trace of one. But still, maybe you had some money lying around to use that whenever you need it. And who, who'd have thought of it? If you get the purge of a Macrophage, the sandboxes actually give you the money that you might need for ending run. Okay, now we have a, now we have an ice. What else can we do with it? And then the next step is, hey, if you have a lot of traces, Arya Bata deck becomes really strong. Because that is a card that rewards you for doing a lot of traces. And it also rewards you for having assets that you, that you can protect. But how do you protect them? For, for a while, Elven also played this out of any age, where... Sometimes the corps struggle to score an AR enhanced security to protect the assets, so okay, why not apply it out of control in the message? So we now have the framework of the deck, and it kind of builds itself if you think about it. You just go through the card pool and look for cards that do the things that synergize with your previous premises and the logical conclusions from them. And piece by piece, you build the deck. So in this case, we have a framework of Sandbox, Macrophage, Aria Bata Attack, and con controlling the message. And the rest was just taken to, um, taken from the und nutzen kind of CTM that was also popular at one point. So the MCA austerity policies to take away a click from the runner, to also protect you a bit against APOC, stuff like that. And also to then use those clicks to score either 4-2s or 5-3s. Uh, together with Jeeves for just forward tempo, some Amani Sinai action, like just, just stuff that synergizes with all the rest of it. Mumba temples, Rashidas, stuff like that. So... Yeah, this was kind of easy, technically. Like, if you if you think about it from this perspective and find the central premise that is strong and find, like, conclusions that are strong, you obviously end up with a strong deck. Um, in hindsight, it looks really easy. Doing that is really hard. Like, for a long while, people in our team were convinced that this is just one of Elvin's decks because this is what he t tends to play, but it tends... It turned out to be really, really strong and did really well at Beacom, winning all of the eight games that he played with it. So yeah, one more example of that. I've talked about Hive and Max before, and I will talk about it again because I really, really like the deck. And it was also one that was really fun to build. Um, back in the day when I, when when Pinsel came up with the idea, um, we played a few games and <laughs> the deck really looked hor horrible. Like it, it just didn't work. Um, I tried to find the the deck list that we played it, like or the, the, the initial deck lists. Unfortunately, Pinsel is working on JNet most of the time when he when he's building decks, so there is no history that we could use. So the original decks got lost in time. But I remember it was a Hoshiko deck. I think it was doing like the typical DreamNet Hoshiko stuff. But then tried to also install HiveMind and Nobkiri, and then somehow get the viruses together on HiveMind, and it was just too much to assemble. And I I think I. I I maybe played Palana against them or something, and Palana at the time wasn't even good. And it just... It, the runner didn't ha have any pressure. It couldn't interact with the corp, and it just like felt weird. But Pinsel was of opinion, no, there is something strong in Hive Mind and the things that I can build around it. So he iterated on it. He changed the things. He changed a lot of things. And then I remember like the first game was horrendous. The second game was like, okay, there might be something to it. And the third game, he just wiped the floor with me because... They got to a point where all the key pieces were already there and the, the synergies were strong enough to take over and help you get to a point where you could interact with the corp and where you could pressure them in ways that they hadn't answers for. So what was the deck about for everyone who 
is maybe either new to the game or wasn't around when Hyphen Max was big or never took the time to really learn the deck. The deck was about just being Max and having 45 cards, so you get through your deck really quickly. That means you have access to a lot of your stuff if you find the correct recursion tools. For example, you have a lot of programs. You have, I think, 19 programs in the first version that we played. And this was at the early bird tournament, which was the first um, the first tournament after Gateway came out. So um, I think there was a rotation with it included as well. So it was the first tournament uh, in the new card pool and people were looking for the best things to do. And we found this deck and brought it and did rather well with it. Um, and it had 19 programs. So you are you are throwing a lot of those into the trash by just max milling. Obviously, you want to have your your uh, heap breakers in your heap, but the rest of the cards you technically don't actually want to lose. Um, so of the cards that you want to really get into your hand, we played them as three offs, and the other ones we could then grab back with Simul Chip, which we had three copies of as well. Um, also, since uh, we are playing with a lot of viruses, and we want to use the if we want to somehow make hive mind stronger and stronger th there was no choice besides knob curie to do that so the, the central premise of the deck was how can i build a deck around knob curie and progenitor uh knob curie and hive mind that does the best and one way of doing that was to realize that you, even though you had a lot of mu because knob curie kind of gives you three mu for virus purposes hive mind also was two mu and was like really difficult to keep on board so progenitor was the first thing that synergizes with it, protects you from purges, and just gets you going. And the rest of the deck was kind of just a typical max setup. Uh, you just have your typical Econ of Dirt, Laundry Show, Gamble, Daily Cast. In this deck with Fermenta, you can also generate a lot of money, which we find out, found out. And then, uh, yeah, just do unarmed things, which in the case of max means throw a lot of stuff in the trash and see what you get. This also made it really hard to test because um, there is a lot of things to learn of how to pilot these decks. And I think one strength of our testing group is that we have both good deck builders and good players and Pinsel, who is kind of both. Um, so if good ideas come to the table, there are people who can pilot them really well from the get-go and get to a point where we can actually find out how good these ideas actually are. And so, yeah. We we came up with this deck, and over the over the year or so it was legal. We tried a lot of things. Uh, you can here see I, I went through my history of uh, the deck list in NRDB and like looked at all the things that we tried. I think in the beginning we tried like Wildcat Strike because we wanted more money. Then we realized that no, actually if you if you pilot this better, you don't need the money. We also looked at Virus Breeding Ground because it does a thing that this deck might want to do. And Virus Breeding Ground was also a card that was like regarded as rather bad similar to hive mind so we want to look at it again and see if that is if that holds true unfortunately it did hold true virus breeding ground didn't really do the thing that we wanted it to do also we looked at stuff like moshing just, just like general uh unarch cards that are good and moshing did some things that were good for us but not enough didn't really feel worth the slots uh, we changed the number of knob curies, the number of progenitors, stuff like that, because with Max, as you are trashing a lot of things, you really need to think about how many copies do I need to ensure I get this card. And for a while we thought, okay, maybe we only need knob curie once we get to the bottom of our decks and we get it back with labor rights. So maybe we can get away with only playing one copy. But it was good enough in the cases, or like it was really good in the cases where you drew it with your max draw or with the manual draws. So we realized, no, no, we need two copies of it. Also played around with cards like Reclaim to maybe get things that are not programs back. Didn't really work out. Kind of felt like a second copy of Nobcury sometimes, but you need to squint really hard to get there. So we took it out again. Um, cards like Mad Dash, which went in and went out, depending also on the ban list of the time. Um, but in the end, we realized we don't really need it. We have enough power in the deck as well. Also, Clot was a meta call that got in and out, depending on how we felt we were poised against the fast advanced decks. Generally, with the uh, synergy of Conduit and Hive Mind, we felt we were fast enough to get to their agendas before they could fast advance, so we took it out, but at some point we put it back in because we weren't as sure anymore. Also, here one question where piloting becomes really important because we, we found out that if you pilot the deck well enough, you don't need the Clot. 
but it is a good insurance if you like get into a weird spot or haven't been able to get the most out of the cards that you got so it's kind of you can also see clot as like kind of training wheels with the decks at some points so sometimes it was good to put it in also <laughs> one more uh wild cut uh since we wanted to play 45 cards and we typically ended up having 46 card decks it was really hard to find the last cut and at some points in time we also even cut one of the breakers because we had botulus and omaku and we're like yeah this is fine we can just we, we can do enough and we don't need mk ultra or others were like no we need mk ultra but we don't need black orchestra after people start magnet like we kind of never cut black orchestra again but still uh, it was one option at, at the time also the juice is wild it's just a good card that laundry is just a good card and the question was how many of which do you play how much influence do you have open stuff like that but in the end when i looked at this i also was pretty surprised like all of these changes were reverted back and the final version that like comparing the first version that i ever played to the final version i've ever played the only changes that we really did was to remove two earthrise because we felt we can just draw manually and it is fine enough for two poemus which ended up like just smoothing our entire uh economy and removing the Amakua and replacing it with DJ Fenris because the combination of DJ Fenris into Steve with Rebirth into Omar was just incredibly powerful. To have access to all your cards again when you need it directly into your hand was just too good. But like, yeah, you can see there was a lot of exploration done here. In this case, a lot of them turned out to be solvable by piloting instead, so we removed it back. But it is you really need to look at all the cards in the card pool like go through your binders look through everything and see whether look for every single card that could do something in your deck and then evaluate whether it does the thing you want yeah and finally i want to come to a very recent deck that we built and which was the um initial point why i wanted to even do this talk which was uh the pe deck that we built and brought to continentals uh, this thing came to being uh, came into being in a discussion between me and Jakuza, so me and Elvin, um, who kind of had interest in the Gentechi faction and tried to do stuff with it. Uh, I had built a deck that did a thing, but I wasn't happy with. Elvin had built a deck that did a thing that he wasn't happy with, and we just just exchanged um, our experience and like stories about how the decks played. So. On the right, you can see my deck, which was which I named Random Pile because that was how it felt. It felt like it did random things, and some of them were good, some of them were bad, but I couldn't really decide on why and which of those were good. And if I do the same analysis that I talked about before, I would say the central premise of this deck was Regenesis. I, I looked at Regenesis was like, this is a strong thing, so I want to do something with it. I guess the first thing which that meant was restoring humanity would be a good idea because I want to keep stuff face down in archives and not have it look weird. So uh, having the idea to, um, <laughs> as like an excuse to have face down stuff in archives that the runner might not check that much, uh, was a good start. Also then, I I looked at Regenesis and was like, okay, this needs some form of fast advance because if I want to score this on board, it will just get stolen way too often. Even with the entire fear around Jinteki faction, I think it will get stolen too often. So the thing I did was, okay, what about Vladisibir's Grid? What about Moonpool? These are cards that um, are able to fast advance with Genesis without triggering its like turn off condition of having trashed a card in the same turn. So, okay, let's put those in. Uh, Vladisibir's Grid went in two times because it has a hefty... Um, Influence cost, I would guess Moonpool in, in the beginning went in three times because when building a deck, you typically want to like um, increase the chances of finding the cards you think do something in it. So you, even if you think two Moonpool in the end will be correct, playing three in the beginning might also be a good idea just to, just to be able to draw it and see how it feels. Mm. Finally, now that we have Moonpool and Bloody Burks, I realize, okay, I need to protect those things because this deck will not run a lot of ice because the boat was already a thing in the matter so part of the idea was to have to be less reliant on good ice so whatever i do will need to protect itself so what i did was to put in two cerebral ore writers and three urtica ciphers and the idea would be to uh the the, the gameplay idea would be to install advanced advanced that is a grid 
on top of a best case Urtica cipher or Cerebral Override that you just installed before. If the runner runs now, you can just give them 4 net damage or 2 core damage whenever you want to. So it is really hard for the runner to, even if they know what you're doing, to contest your Vladisibir grid. And that means now you can actually use the Vladisibir grid for something else. For example, for scoring agendas. Though you need to be careful if you protect it with your trap. Um, over installing that also treasures the thing. So the, the, the play patterns were kind of weird, but the deck did some things that I liked. So... Yeah, it stayed in. And finally, the things that we do, like the Vladzy Burst, the Cerebral Override, and so on, needed some amplification. So I put in Mitosis, because Mitosis is a really, really good card. It does a lot of things in two clicks, and this is its strength. Comparing it to Mushin, which we had before, reveals that Mushin was more of an all-in card. You paid zero, you got three advancements on a card, which is like the equivalent of six or seven clicks, depending on how you count it, of installing and advancing things and clicking for the credits that you use. So it was a really efficient card, but also a really one-sided card. You installed a single threat, the runner either ran it or didn't, and that was it. It was, it was really kind of a coin flip of what happened afterwards. If the runner ran it, was it points, was it not? Um, Mitosis does more for you. It does cost three credits and two clicks, so there is a cost attached to it, but it installs two threads for you and even leaves a click open to do other things as well. And that means whatever you are doing with the deck that needs advancement tokens, Mitosis will amplify because now suddenly, from out of nothing, two th double advanced threads are on the board that the runner needs to um, deal with. So yeah, it went in. I played a few games with it. Found out that like scoring four points was really easy because there were a lot of points in the game where I managed to score a Genesis either out of hand or just from the board or something or just my toes it out and the runner doesn't check it stuff like that. So the deck did work to get to four points, but it was I found it really hard to get to seven because I actually need to score three more points and after doing the Genesis trick, trick once. Uh, doing it again was pretty hard because either the runner stole your other copy of it or started to check archives more or whatever. It it was kind of weird and it often ended out just being install double advanced bacteria programming. They don't check. You score the thing, which is fine. But like if they had checked, your entire game plan would have fallen apart. So it, it didn't feel right. On the other side, kind of parallel to me, Jakuza built his deck and his approach was different. Obviously, coming from him, his central premise was what he calls tempo, what, what I wouldn't. Uh, what, what I would more call like an asset spammy, installing a lot of things that the runner has to deal with, which I guess you could call tempo. Um, and just generally playing a lot of assets that do something for you. C um, centrally, and also you can see in the name of the, of the deck, uh, the card Bladderword. Because Bladderword looked like a pet campaign with an extra thing on it, and... Looks kind of interesting. So now we are looking at net damage. So the ID choice is obviously PE because it does net damage things pretty well. Um, furthermore, we want some more hand pressure. So we include some more damage sources. He did include the clearing houses. He also did include the um, Urtica ciphers and cerebrals that I had because he also realized that my Mitosis was a good card. And all of those things do pressure the runner into having to deal with um, or pressing the runner's hand, having to deal with damage. Um, especially like if you landed a Cerebral Overwriter, um, the runner situation became a lot more dire because they had to now work with three cards or sometimes even one card if you got to it. So the, the pressure helped to make Bladderword do even more work for you as every single point of net damage became more important to the runner as it stacked up with all of the other sources. For example, Sting or Snares or other cards. Also your Rise, which is able to uh, deal a lot of damage. And then if you have all of those damage sources, now Blood in the Water looks really good. As once you pressure down the runner's hand, scoring this becomes a lot easier. And you sometimes even end up just winning the game by scoring two Blood in the Waters. Because they had one card and they had zero cards on a PE uh, ping and then they, they lost the game. Also, since you're playing with Mitosis... Uh, cards like Sting end up being like really powerful hidden traps that you don't really care if it gets stolen or if you score it because both 
scenarios are good for you. And also to, together with the clearing houses, if they don't get checked, you can just have two damage on the board whenever you need it. And all of these things were pretty good. So we had both had our ideas. Also, he was playing Regensis, but like found also that it didn't do really much for you sometimes. And with all of those things, we came together, we compared our uh, ideas and realized that we were doing similar-ish things, but um, different enough from each other with different perspectives that uh, bring those two things together might be pretty powerful and might lead us to a deck that is actually capable of doing a thing. Because you have to imagine the matter at that point was uh, runners found boat, and this was after the APEC tournament, so uh, Sokka had already proven that the boat was a really, really strong card that pressured all corps to do something about it. And we decided that, hey, if we just don't play any good ice, we can either just tax out the boat on tokens by stacking the, the, the ice on a server that actually matters, or just not draw that many bad cards as any ice drawn wouldn't just do anything against the boat. And so we looked at the two decks on the left mine, on the right Elvins, and tried to find out what are the good things about this, what are the bad things about this, and try to come up with a deck that was capable of subverting the, the boat on the runner side, but just not using that much ice and not basing the strategy around ice. So what we came up with was a deck that then, in the end, me and Mr. Buggles brought to the European Continentals, or the EACC, uh, which I didn't do that well with, but Mr. Buggles demonstrated that the deck was capable of doing something. And um, yeah, we, we had these two deck ideas and had to now find out what was actually a good thing about our decks. What was the thing that made us feel like there is something in here? And we realized, okay, that, that card we're talking about, the Cerebral Overwriter, that card alone was capable of A, generating fear, and B, generating board states where the runner has to work with three or two or one cards in hand all the time because they took so, many, so much core damage. So, okay, if you look at this now, what is our logic behind our deck? What should we try to optimize around and what should we try to play with? So the central premise became, okay, wait, ice is bad right now. So what about we use fear instead of ice? What, what if we just make the runner doubt every one of their decisions instead of doubting whether they can get into a server by breaking ice? Okay, so our ice suit became very minimal. We decided that we, the sentries were the most playable cards and ice is still good enough for you to include some of it and have the runner respect it, install their breakers, install their boat. Um, but it was we were forced into a situation where we couldn't um, spend much resources on the ice that we raised. So we picked three times Anemone because it did a thing that we wanted to do, deal damage. And we picked three times Otoroshi, which was a find by Heinzel that was amazing. He just dropped into our group chat and went to bed and we were like, yeah, this is the car that we needed. Because Otoroshi was cheap and it did all the things we wanted to and the runner pretty much was forced to either break it or pay three to not have the sub fire and then you could do some Yomi things with the um, advancement tokens that it gives you. Okay, so we have a deck that has decided ice is bad. We're using fear instead. So we are double advancing stuff with mitosis or manually and then have the runner not run our things because not because they can't get in, but because they don't want to get in. Okay, so we have two types of cards now that we are threatening the runner with. On one side, advanced cards. On the other side, unadvanced cards. The advanced cards could be traps or agendas. So the 50-50 the, the here is clear. It's either Cerebral or an Urtica, or on the other side, it is an agenda that we want to score. So the runner is kind of forced into deciding which of those to run, or like, Ignoring all of them, trying to win somewhere else, and then we can use that to our advantage. The unadvanced cards could be either useful for us or like stuff like snares or stings, typically. So useful cards for us would be Moonpool, which allows us to, in an instant speed, add advancement tokens to a thing. That could mean either we want to score something out with fast advance or like with something that's on the board that we can combo with other stuff, or if the runner has decide to run the Serial Overwriter, we can make it worse by using Moonpool and putting additional tokens on it. So typically this means um, so yeah, in, in a, typically this means a double advanced Cerebral becomes a, a quadruple advanced Cerebral and just ends the game pretty much on the spot. 
Obviously, now after this first approach, we realized that we need to mix up these advanced and unadvanced cards as well. So sometimes we ended up not advancing the cerebral because the runner would be more um, enticed to run our not advanced cards because that's where the useful stuff lies. And then we could use our moon pool to then give them two core damage from out of no, out of nowhere from an unadvanced card, which was also a strong thing to do. Also, we realized that the typically unadvanced cards like uh, Rashida's moon pools we could put out with mitosis. So we mitosis out a moon pool and a clearing house or something. The runner doesn't check them because they're afraid of traps. And then we have two cards that do something for us. The moon pool doesn't even use the advancement tokens on it, but the, the tokens kind of ice the card and help us make it stick so that we can assemble a board state that will win the game. So typically what ended up was that by installing all of these cards, we ran kind of poor, but a lot of cards lay, lay around with two or three or four advancement tokens on them. So we realized, okay, now if we use, if, if we have those cards lying around, we want to use them somehow. So we realized that if a clearing house lies around, that is good because we can just do damage. And then typically maybe kill the runner with some scores together with Neurospike or Trick of Light the the tokens that lie around and then win that way and we tried both and actually like swipped and swapped around a lot between neurospike and um trick of light but in the end the deck that we played played neurospike because we felt like this was the more unexpected one that caught more people off guard and still as we think about going into a tournament we think about playing this deck in swiss where uh, players typically don't know what we're doing so they're getting people by surprise was also a good way of winning games Later on in the uh, cut, we also thought that Neurospike created a threat. Only, but it like it was a one-off, but still created the threat that runner needed to um, be aware of and respect. So it might make them run our double advanced cards more, so we could adjust our play style a bit and install more traps and have them run it because they were respecting Neurospike. Maybe a lot of this deck was reading your opponent, reading their reactions, and um, it also made it kind of difficult to actually build the deck and discuss it because we weren't able to really play it against ourselves because we were like a few steps ahead in the thinking process and played differently against it than um, players who hadn't any experience against it might. But yeah, this was where we land landed at. And it was kind of similar to what Jakuza built, but no none of us two were actually uh, did find the correct central premise in, in, in the beginning and only by discussing this and by iterating and iterating and iterating we found the reasoning that made us include the, the correct cards in the correct amounts I feel. We still did a bit more iteration afterwards after the tournament but this is kind of where the deck landed and yeah um, so much for the PE deck and all of these decks, especially the PE deck is are things that um kind of seen as unfun by players like this this pe deck the ctm deck we talked about these are powerful cards uh powerful decks that use certain cards to their fullest extent and by doing so do something that the designers didn't really intend to end up with and create board states that are really oppressive for the other side and this is also something to be aware of if you do this a lot you will end up with decks that either don't have a good win condition but are have a really strong basis and then games tend to do take longer or in this case people tend to not like what you're doing because they feel like they don't have any agency because all you do is feels random to them but um it is still a, a way you need to take it is it is a it is a um these are steps you need to do to get to a point where um you are able to build every kind of deck where, you, where you're able to um, think about the game from all different perspectives and come up with ideas and then uh, be able to build the best thing you can in a certain direction and also then learn how to best play against it because you know what makes it up and then um, what felt random before might now not look as random to you anymore because you know what the deck is up to. So, okay, let's try to wrap this up as I've already talked longer than I aim to do and talk about how to aim for competitiveness. I would, so for anyone who 
um, comes to me and asks me, how do I get better at the game? How do I build better decks? I tend to tell them, play all of the current tier 1 decks that you can find. Play all the things that are doing well on Netrunner DB that did well on, in tournaments and find out what makes them tick. And think about the central premises that the deck builder had in mind when building the thing and the, the key cards and the key interactions that seem to be the powerful thing that the deck does. And then, as a second step, think of cards and strategies that might exploit these things. So think about one once you find, for example, a runner that does really well. Think of the cards on the other side that might exploit the singular thing that this runner is doing. If the runner is pretty linear in what it what it what they do, um, maybe you can find corp cards that e exploit the singular thing. For example, in the case of boat, it was pretty easy to look at all the cards that trash hardware or bounce hardware and then build strategies that specifically try to bounce the boat as many times as they can with stuff like self-growth program because that was a strong thing to do. Or even harder, think of new unexplored synergies of cards that haven't been played a lot, of ways that aren't that obvious to play around certain things, and just just explore the game. Just explore the entire space of cards and things that they do and learn what makes what makes certain effects good in the game and then learn to evaluate how certain cards um, fit into this metagame. And then boil that entire assortment of ideas down to a central premise and build the deck and iterate on it as many times as you can. Talk with people about it, play games, um, see how other players play your deck, which is also an interesting thing because you might be playing it a different way than they do and they might have different ideas that you don't have yet. And then just iterate on that as much as you can. Also, what I found, which what helped me a lot, was to just play a lot of different formats because standard especially tends to have a certain play style because it has such a large card pool that allows for certain critical amounts of cards to come together. For example, the tag me strategies only work because there are a lot of cards that either tag you or help you benefit from being tagged or protect you from dying because of tags. But different formats might not have those cards. So you're forced into different strategies, maybe more basic strategies. The basic action cards become a lot better in certain formats than in others. And experiencing all of these different forms of the game and experiencing also different card pools and metas that come out of that uh, helps you then look at standard from a different perspective and maybe find things that others can't because you have done this in a different way somewhere else but it also somehow applies to standard at this point so just examples of formats that i've played in the past or like i've been part of uh, the modded format which was interesting because it was just the core set plus one cycle it was really really limited so the basic action card became a lot stronger than other formats and this is an interesting thing to play around with Cash Refresh had this interesting bit of where, um, since the format was a core set, um, or like three copies of a core set, I guess, the newest cycle and a big box of your choice, whatever you chose became really relevant. And um, making the correct decision on which big box you want to play, especially if you play an ID or like a, an archetype that is not necessarily bound to a single big box, was also pretty interesting. Stuff like core experience also goes into the, or like startup goes into the idea of the basic action card being more relevant than this in standard maybe. Um, but also like the, the really wacky formats like Ocarina, where you where your ID is a resource or an agenda in the game, which is like turns the complete game on its head because things that you would get later on in the game, you start out with, and that might change your deck building style a lot. And give you a completely new perspective on the game. Stuff like Identity Crisis, where you play the agendas of one uh, corp in another corp, and um, like, or like build a deck in one faction and then import it into a different ID from another faction, are interesting ways of looking at the game from a different perspective as well. Um, the random formats like Fragmented, Mystery Box, Random Access Memories, where just random packs get chosen and you you play with combination of cards that may, may never have been standard legal at the same point in time make you look at the game and look at every single card and ask yourself, okay, what does this go with? What else do I have in this specific card pool? Especially in the format of random access memories, how much time do I, ha do I have to 
like just explore this because I need to build a deck maybe and the time is ticking and I need to be finished in five minutes. So at what point do I stop and just go, this is fine enough, let's build the other deck. Stuff like that is really interesting and and texts you and like um, asks you to do things that you might have not done before and trains you in ways that you are not experienced in yet. Also stuff like Read Error, which is just start up with a different set, which combines the gateway cards with FFG cards that have never seen play together typically, and also creates interesting interactions. And there is a lot of a lot more formats here uh, that I could talk about um, that have seen play over the course of the game. And just playing all of these, experimenting around in them, A is just plain fun, and B trains you in ways that help your standard deck building game a lot. And finally, um, how do I play the pile that I just created? Um, since you can build everything you want, but you also need to be knowledgeable enough about piloting them uh, to find out where the thing you just built is doing the things that you want from it. And I would like give you the goal of freeing yourself from a single play style, which I'm also uh, um, doing or <laughs> trying myself because everybody has a play style or certain decks that they are most familiar with or most comfortable with and trying to expand that uh, area is a really um, difficult task and everybody struggles with that but the more different things you have played in your time with the game and the more things you are at least somewhat experienced in the more different perspectives you have on the game and the more things you can think about and the, the better your decks can become so with every different archetype and every different deck Try to learn the advantages and disadvantages of that specific deck and try to maximize your knowledge in all different directions. So learn to ask yourself the crucial questions for every single deck. So for example, if I'm playing a Glacier deck, the main questions that you should probably be on your mind is, do I have a scoring window right now? If not, how can I create one? Um, can I bait the runner into a run that is bad for them and then create a scoring window that way? If you're playing a prison deck, the question might be, how do I lose? Uh, I learned this <laughs> when playing the Labus deck back in German Nationals 2019, which happened early 2020, I guess, um, which was a really interesting deck that um, where the late game was so strong that all you need to do in the early and mid game was to think about how do I not lose the game right now? What, what central do I need to ice? What do I need to do to keep the runner out of everything that I have? To make them have no op opportunities to win the game because I know that if I keep them from winning for long enough I will win by default because the interactions that I have in my deck in that case it was like red plan couriers that uh, advance the govern take over and just scored six points was so strong that the main question in your mind became how do I lose and that is a really interesting way of looking at the game which then also sometimes occurs in other archetypes as well where you just realize that you have the game in the back, you just now have to find out the, the key central to ice to not lose, for example. There are these decks that I found hi hard to label, which are like Tempo Hybrid, the Super Modernism decks in Wayland were these kinds of decks, or like generally Argus decks in the past were these kinds of decks, that try to generate lose-lose situations for the runner. For example, you install the thing in a remote where there were some price eggs, so when the runner ran there, and stole the agenda, they got tagged by Data Raven, they got tagged by Prysac, they maybe even got tagged by your Argus ability or like lost lost cards from hand from your Argus ability and then didn't have enough time to de get rid of all of those tags, for example, especially once Border Control came out and even text the clicks on the runner more. Um, and then if they do all of that and kind of manage to get rid of all the tags, maybe then you can hardly use them because they got poor doing so. Or if they don't run, you score the thing and advance your bots that way so that whatever the runner does is a good option for you and that question also came up in the uh, in the shell game deck that i had just talked about previously because um you, you tend to want to have cards that do something no matter if the runner runs them or doesn't so sometimes you need to ask yourself how can i how can i make sure that no matter what the runner chooses to do i end up with benefiting from that interaction also with shell games decks uh, especially it becomes 
very important to know what the runner thinks the board looks like right now, because sometimes it enables you to do things that you, you shouldn't be able to pull off, but somehow do, which also might happen in a Glacier deck, where you need to think about, does the runner think they can get into the server right now? Because if they don't think they can get into there, because they think you have a toll booth and an Anansi and something, but you know that you only have a vanilla and, I don't know, a slot machine, um, you might be able to score behind that server. Even though, with complete knowledge of the board state, you shouldn't be able to do so. So, no, looking at the game from runner's perspective and thinking about what they think the game state is like can be a good question and maybe a, a little quip at the fast advanced players. Like Sometimes there are some really linear decks that only care about do I have the card in hand? If so, let's play it. If not, draw for it. Which can also be an experience, actually, that is important because sometimes the correct answer to do is just draw up because the important card in your deck needs to be in your hand as quickly as possible and like spending clicks for credits or spending clicks for installing ice that will not matter is not the thing that will push you forward and make you win but you just need to get the card so all of these different archetypes ask questions or like make you ask yourself questions that are really good for your gameplay and learning all of those different archetypes playing all of them having experience in all of them makes you a better player makes you a better pilot of any deck you might be able to come up with and finally when you do all of these things also talk to players who re regularly plays well with those decks or like who are who have built the decks or who are experienced with the decks get into contact with them ask them publicly ask them in private chats and just ask them maybe if they if they can look over your shoulder while you're playing a game on jnet to just give you some advice because the best way of learning in this game is just talk with players just just Generally, people love to t talk about the game, so giving them opportunities to talk is a really good way of learning because they will talk. Like, I I've been talking for an hour because I just love this game. So just ask people, and you'll gain a lot of knowledge just passively by listening to them. All right, so finally, uh, as kind of a bit of a homework, I will give you some central premises that I either built myself at some point, or at least thought about, or... Uh, oh. Maybe also I have a typo on this. On this, um, some some um, yeah, some central premises that are possible, and some decks that you might just want to build as a deck building exercise. For example, you can build a deck with three times Trieste uh, model Bioroid. So what does that do for you? It kind of helps you create fear because ice becomes unbreakable, maybe might mean that you want more remotes because the triad needs to live somewhere maybe you want to be asa maybe you want to be something else a lot of questions that you need to ask yourself when you're building this deck it will not necessarily be the strongest deck at least in nwe we tried it it, it was fun but not didn't seem the best thing you could do in the faction but try to build the deck try to come up with the best one you can and then try to realize what makes it good what interactions are really good in that deck and maybe also what are the reasons that this is not the best thing you can do? What other interactions are in the game that are better than it? You can also build a deck during Sense and City Grid with Op. How do you get there? Okay, you need to trash the 7 cost thing. What 7 cost things are there? How do I trash them? How do I trash them quickly? Like, there are a lot of questions you need to ask yourself to get there. And especially if you want to build Op, these might be questions that are good for you to ask because you need to ask yourself uh, what the patterns are that uh emerge in the gameplay with the deck that you are just building that you haven't even played yet so interesting things to think about another thing that i did in the past and maybe i should do again sometime is uh, building a net deck so net nathaniel the runner who wants to have two or less cards in hand to gain some credits and while that idea ability isn't really that strong because it is asking you to do a really dangerous thing and it, like limits your options uh, to only get a few credits a deck that uses its cards generally is good so maybe you can find a deck that is really really good at just using all the cards they draw and having and ending the turn on on few cards then in the beginning of the deck uh, in, the, in the beginning of the turn maybe draw a few more cards get more cards in hand get options then use them go down low in cards again and end your turn always on like zero or one cards in hand it may not be the best thing it might also be a very dangerous thing especially with like pe's around but 
it is an interesting deck building question and might uh, give you an insight into how to get a lot of value out of the cards that you have in your hand. And finally, um, something like a deck building exercise that uh, Pinsel and I did uh, during German Nationals and which attracted a few spectators that also like gathered around us while we we're doing this. Uh, we looked at Drago and felt like, okay, there is a lot of abuse possible here. Drago is a really powerful card that can do something that wasn't previously possible in the game, which is give single tags kind of easily. So the question was, what can we do with this? What is the best interaction we can get out of Drago? What are, what are the cards that synergize well with it? We already saw some of them, obviously, with the Sokka's fun r deck that um, won APEC Continentals. Um, but what else can we do with it? Like, well, what cards are there that benefit of a single tech? How how can we put up enough pressure with the runner for them to fall over and just not be able to interact with us anymore? And all of these ideas could give you some insight into some uh, direction of the game that you maybe haven't explored yet. So these are the ones that I came up with that you can try out. If you have other ideas, try them out for yourself. Maybe. Um, shoot me a message of what you tried and how you how you felt about it, how how it worked for you. These are interesting discussions. They have interesting ideas to try out. So I'd implore you to just explore all of this. And yeah, that's it from me. Um, I will try to also arrange a roundtable with some of the NWE members uh, because you have now heard my perspective on this and I've my ideas about it but like every player is looking at it differently and it could be interesting to uh, talk with others and just have us discuss in an open format about these kinds of questions and yeah i'll try to arrange that if it happens it will also go online on this channel and yeah with that i want to stop yammering about uh, i talked for at least 30 more minutes than i wanted to so uh, i will end the recording here thank you all for listening and Stay tuned, maybe at some point in the future, whenever uh, me or somebody else finds something to talk about, other stuff might appear on this channel. Take care.